Hi, I'm Rob Mickelson. I'm the Director of Agronomic Services for Yara in North America. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking to you today about making micronutrient fertilizer recommendations. This is a rather big topic, so we've decided to break this up into two parts. Right now we'll be talking about some of the background fundamental principles of making a micronutrient fertilizer recommendation, including how to select the right source. And then in the second video, we'll talk more specifically about how to use those different sources to get the most efficiency and to get the most micronutrient into the crop. We've been addressing the issue of replacing nutrients that are removed during each crop harvest for many years, such as this article from 1953. I'm more initially concerned with the macronutrients, such as N, P, and K, but now we're increasingly dealing with shortages of micronutrients. Of course, the total amount of nutrient removed is much smaller, but their soil supply and the amount available for plant uptake is becoming an issue of concern in many cropping systems. We won't spend much time today reviewing the chemistry and physiology of each of these essential plant and micronutrients. We'll save that for another time. But just remember that each of these nutrients is essential for plant growth. But recall that micronutrients by themselves are not miracle workers, but merely an essential component in sustaining those crop yields. Now you've probably seen pictures such as these before, these deficiency symptoms where micronutrients are lacking. I mean, these photos are provided by Dr. Pitche at Tennessee State University, and they nicely illustrate the importance of balanced nutrition and remind us of the essential role of micronutrients. Now, maybe like me, we're often quick to notice these deficiency symptoms when they appear in the leaves, but a lack of micronutrients also has devastating effects for the root growth, as illustrated in this picture. So as a quick review, let's recall that micronutrients are essential plant nutrients, and we're seeing more occurrences of deficiency these days. They have an essential role in providing balanced nutrition, where if any single nutrient is lacking, the plants can't effectively use any of the other nutrients. And the lack of micronutrients often delays plant maturity and can cause damage in crop quality too. And the higher yields and profits that we're targeting these days requires an adequate supply of all the nutrients, including micronutrients, that are present in the root zone during the entire growing season. So again, we won't talk about this in detail today, but just recall that micronutrients have many vital roles in the plant. This includes serving as regulators in many of the physiological functions in the plant, and they're essential for the activation of many enzymes. They're responsible for efficient photosynthesis in manufacturing many of those plant metabolites that are necessary. And then, of course, for transferring energy throughout the plant. So as we talk about micronutrient nutrition, realize that for most farmers, they're dealing with many factors that are potentially limiting crop yields. But all farmers that are wanting to achieve maximum yields must consider micronutrients in a potential shortage that might be keeping them from reaching their goals. So we acknowledge that crop response to fertilizers and most inputs is based on the probability of response. I can tell you when you are most likely to see a yield or quality increase from good crop nutrition, but I can almost guarantee that a nutrient deficiency will keep you from reaching those high yields you're looking for. I think everyone has seen this figure many times before. It's the famous Liebig's Law of the Minimum, and it states that crop yields are limited by that factor which is most limiting in the field. And it treats crop nutrition such as this diagram. Um, once you take care of one factor at the bottom, such as soil pH, then you next address nitrogen, and then phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, and then micronutrients. Now the order of these limiting factors will change depending on your specific soil, but, and your crop, and your yield goals. 
But this is just one example. Now, can I tell you that I think this whole approach is wrong? It doesn't tell the entire story. Do plants really respond to individual nutrients? Well, of course not. They are all required in balance. They need to work together to achieve satisfactory results. It's certainly not a stair-step approach where we take care of one nutrient at a time, but it's the entire package for them to work together. For example, if nitrogen is limiting, then phosphorus and potassium uptake will also be limited. Let's say boron is deficient, then cell wall development and membrane integrity, they're permanently damaged and that entire plant will never grow well, even if all the other nutrients are in adequate supply. I started making a partial list of some of the limiting factors that can be controlled in crop production. I stopped after a while because the list was getting too long. And we're going to focus strictly on micronutrients today, but understanding that all these factors have to be considered to have successful production. Look at this picture of a crop response to added zinc fertilizer. Let's go through the process of determining where micronutrient fertilization will be helpful. Often we begin with a soil test. First of all, even getting a representative sample of the root zone is essential in getting an accurate soil recommendation. The soil sample then goes to the lab where the nutrients are extracted, chemically analyzed, and the data is interpreted to predict the likelihood of a crop response. And then the next step is to make a fertilizer recommendation. As an example, these are some typical micronutrient concentrations that might be extracted from a soil in the laboratory. The next step is to make a prediction of whether additional nutrients are added to reach the yield goals. You've seen graphs like this before, looking at the probability of yield responses, ranging from low to high probability of yield responses from added fertilizer. Now I can tell you in real life, these curves are not nearly as smooth and perfect as this chart indicates. When making a fertilizer recommendation, the goal is to predict the amount of nutrient the soil can supply. And in this example, it's indicated in the red bars. And then next, we want to predict the need required to supplement the soil supply with added fertilizer, indicated in the yellow bars. That which is necessary to meet the demand of a specific crop. But when a farmer receives a fertilizer recommendation from the lab to meet the needs of an individual field and crop, the lab never specifies the source of nutrients they're thinking of in the specific recommendation. Well, does the source of nutrient really make a difference anyway? Well, no and yes. Plants can't tell where the nutrients came from, for example, nitrate from fertilizer is the same as nitrate from manure, as far as the plants can tell. It's the solubility that makes the difference about whether roots can actually access those nutrients for uptake and growth. Here's a few examples. Rock phosphate technically adds phosphorus to the soil, but it may dissolve so slowly over decades or centuries to a plant available form that it's not very valuable as a nutrient source. This chunk of zinc metal in the picture will sit in the soil inert for thousands of years and never supply nutrition to the plant. Elemental sulfur may take months or years to oxidize and become available to plants, compared with ammonium sulfate or yara amidas that both contain immediately soluble sulfate. And another common example is the difference in plant availability between calcium nitrate a source that is very soluble and immediately releases plant available nitrogen compared with many composts that may only release 5 to 25 percent of their total nitrogen within the first year depending on many factors. So these examples illustrate the importance of considering the plant availability of nutrients and not just their chemical content. So it's clear that just talking about pounds per acre of total applied nutrients doesn't begin to tell the whole story. 
The importance of nutrient sources shows up in this photograph from work done in Colorado. All these pots received the same quantity of zinc, but the sources were very different. The response of corn to these five different sources of zinc varied considerably, even though they all received the same amount of zinc. The source clearly made a difference. This illustration reminds us that nutrients must be soluble to be taken up by the roots. I'd like you to consider this question. If a nutrient is added to the soil but not soluble, when is it appropriate to call it a nutrient? So what does soluble really mean? Remember that nutrients need to dissolve before the plants can take them up. But there are so many chemical and biological factors that interact to control solubility and the speed at which they become soluble. So let's take three examples. Let's consider first the solubility of calcium nitrate, or Yara tropicote, which dissolves very quickly in the soil. The nitrate remains soluble in the soil solution, and then the calcium becomes involved in reactions on the cation exchange sites. Um, let's talk about a nutrient source such as compost, which is very challenging to predict the nutrient solubility and its availability for plant nutrition. Compost contains a complex mixture of both organically bound and inorganic nutrients. And due to this uncertainty and complexity, we often just use rough estimates to predict the nutrient supply that will be released during the growing season. So clearly applying a pound of nitrogen from Tropicote will behave very differently than a pound of nitrogen from compost. And then finally, let's consider the reactions of diammonium phosphate, a very common phosphorus fertilizer. DAP, as it's known, will become rapidly soluble, but then it undergoes a variety of chemical reactions that make that phosphorus relatively unavailable at first. That added phosphorus fertilizer quickly dissolves to become adsorbed on the surfaces of the soil, or it can become precipitated as a mineral and also removed from solution. But a small fraction of that added phosphorus fertilizer is now slowly released again over time back into the soil solution so that plants can use it. So the concept of solubility can become confusing as we consider first the initial solubility of the fertilizer but second, the long-term solubility of keeping the roots constantly supplied with an adequate concentration of essential nutrients. So here's just a partial list of some of the insoluble phosphorus compounds that can be formed after fertilizers are added to the soil, and they end up removing soluble phosphorus from solution for a time. This means they will slowly be dissolved and then become available to plants at some point in the future. And sometimes we call these compounds now the legacy phosphorus in the soil. In soil chemistry, we call these factors the thermodynamics and the kinetics, or the speed, of these reactions. So let's wrap up this first part of our discussion. Let's remember that micronutrients are an essential requirement for high-yielding crop production. We can rely on soil and tissue testing to provide that initial guidance that's required for nutrient planning. And when nutrient recommendations come from the lab, they don't account for the efficiency of crop uptake of different fertilizer sources. And not all nutrient sources are the same. In fact, that's why right source is included as a fundamental component of the four R's of nutrient stewardship. In our next video, I'll demonstrate that not all micronutrient sources are the same for plant nutrition, and why it's so important to account for the difference in fertilizer sources when making crop nutrition plans. I'll see you in the next video to discuss specific micronutrient sources, including the unique chemistry provided by Yara Vida Procote Nutrients. Thanks for joining me.